Did you know that this is the sixth consecutive budget presented by Nirmala Sitaraman? The first for any woman finance minister. Did you know this is the shortest speech in recent history? And did you know this is the first budget, a pre-poll budget, which was sans populism? Hello and welcome to another edition of Capital Calculus. I am your host, Anil Padmanabhan. As I explained in the introduction, there are many firsts to this pre-poll budget. Officially, it is called a vote on account. This is because it is an interim arrangement which allows the government machinery to continue to function till such time a new government takes charge in May. But this has never inhibited or prevented any government in the past to indulge in electoral freebies, what Prime Minister calls revedies. Yet, this time it was missing in Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman's budget. Very surprising indeed, frankly a pleasant surprise. Because the Finance Minister was gifted with a very stable macroeconomic backdrop, unprecedented in recent memory. Further, her fiscal books seem to be in order. Put the two together, it basically means she had the fiscal room to indulge her government and announce electoral freebies. Yet, she didn't. Why? To answer this and more, we spoke to Haseeb Drabu. He's an economist and former finance minister of the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir. I began by asking Haseeb what he thought of this year's budget. While it was missing in populism, it was still a very political budget. Oh, of course, it is. Uh, it's a hugely political budget. I think it's the reference to chess is not incidental. It's a metaphor. It's a gambit which has been made by Mr. Modi to forego the opportunity of today for a positional advantage uh, in future. Um, it is also in, it has the signature and style of Mr. Modi to create an event out of a non-event and a non-event out of an event. Uh, here, everybody expected this to uh, be full of freebies and all. But I think on a more serious note, uh, what it does reflect is the first time that uh, the budget has been dealing from the ballot. And that's a very important message, not just in terms of policy and procedures, but in terms of maturing of a democracy. So here you are now saying that I'm not going to link my budget, which if you remember, budgets have been politicized since 19, mid 70s by Mrs. Gandhi and continued to 2019 with Piyush Goyal, who announced 75,000 crores of farmer sops in 2019. It also reflects the confidence of BJP in coming back the third time without having to resort to all this. So there are multiple, not just uh, firsts, but multiple messages uh, in this budget which go beyond the realm of uh, interim budget making. Okay, let me be the devil's advocate here, Asif. Uh, you know, the one big difference between 2019 and 2024 vote on account is the opposition is missing in action. In 2019, you may recall, they had created a large national narrative about rural distress, legitimately so, which forced the BJP on the back foot, which is the reason why they came up with that massive PM Kisan program. This time, after the defeats in the assembly elections, they're missing in action, they're in disarray. So don't you think that they have taken advantage of that rather than probably signaling a big structural shift? Yes, of course, but but that's what when I said that you know this is a, a budget that presumes you're going to come back to power. It's a budget and confidence, right? It's from a very different look at the tone, the tonality of the of the FM. She was talking about what has been achieved. Some of it may be debatable, contentious, but the manner in which it was communicated reflects a certain confidence, and uh, and that of course politically emerges from the fact that. Uh, there is virtually no opposition today. And this just, it's also how you have phased 
all the events going in the right directions, right? Yeah, but starting from G20, there has been an event after an event, whether it's a Monday event or a, you know, whatever it is, it is the run up to the budget has been so beautifully planned. And uh, it's at the last uh, stage, just before the uh, code of thing is announced, you actually do a bit of a grandstanding. It's very, very typically the stamped by uh, Mr. Modi, the, the whole sense of how to convey this. Uh, it's not, now you have also redefined the budget as not being a tool or instrumentality for freebies, but for you know communicating the fiscal stance of the government and looking at aspirational welfareism from what would be called pragmatic uh, uh, you know populism. So you have moved that benchmark. You are now asking people you know, or telling people that I am looking at this new welfare. Uh, state, this welfareism, which is long term, you have to contribute towards it. Kartavya, Kal, you know, all these are symbolic. They may, they may not uh, resonate with the uh, English audience, but it, it is a is a metaphor. Now it's about you know Kartavya, Kal, so you have to do your thing because we are moving another level. So all those are very very important signals. So it's a messaging document which is uh, communicating to the people what the interim budget uh, is for. It's not for freebies. It is for by getting a buy-in on the larger fiscal policy. So it's a great point, Hasib, that uh, how there is a different kind of signaling, political signaling, uh, by the finance minister about this government. One key part of what we have seen in their strategy of providing basics in the last ten years, whether it's electricity, drinking water, banking, and so on, is that you have bought five hundred million Indians. Inside the purview of the formal economy, previously they were outside looking in. So, do you think that uh, this will now play out more in the context of what you just told us? If you were to ask me, the biggest contribution of the last ten years of BJP, it starts off with Arun Jaitley's second budget, which was a massive move towards formalization of the Indian economy. So, if one credits Manmohan Singh or Narasimha Rao for liberalisation of Indian economy, what you should credit um, Arun Jaitley, uh, Narendra Modi, Nirmal Sitharaman is for the formalisation of the Indian economy, and that was not even on the horizon at that point of time. So, yes, it's, it's formalised both in terms of the supply chain networks, in terms of taxation. Now you have a GST, which hugely aided. The formalization of the Indian economy. Even if you are not paying a tax, you still get into the formal setup, uh, whether it's through an ITC or whatever. Um, and then it's about the people getting formalized through all these schemes, which is now identified into those four the new castes, uh, the new varnas of Indian economy, so to say. You know. Um, so yes, of course, that that to my mind is one of the biggest things. It may not be as sexy as liberalization, but it is far more. Penetrative and long-lasting, because you're actually creating uh, a system which drives on its own and is, in some ways, a virtuous cycle of growth, which is what underlies the kind of growth that you're seeing, and also the kind of revenues that are now accruing. I mean, we have money coming out of our ears in GST. You're bringing up a lakh and a half crores a month on GST, and then you have this. Uh, Numerologically determined number of one lakh eleven thousand eleven hundred eleven crores as capex. So must be some some numerology of the old, <laughs> you know, of the kind. So that's that's how you've been able to generate that massive dose of uh, capital expenditure, which is now showing uh, a going back because if you remember, capex had dropped to under two percent of GDP and now going back to levels of three and a half. And if you reach four, four and a half, then you are in a good place. And I think uh, going to the numbers a bit, we have seen for the first time direct taxes are ahead of indirect taxes. Conventional economics says that that's the preferred route because indirect taxes are regressive in nature, impact the poor the worst. So, are we seeing another pivot here, or is this just a one-off situation? No, if you plot it, you will see that this is now becoming a Caesar and. Uh... This, the thing really is that what has happened is that of course the desirable also that to have far more direct and uh, 
lower proportions of it like tax, but we had completely for a variety of reasons and income distribution and all that, not just policy. We would uh, a large part of it would was indirect taxes and uh, direct taxes was limited, but it's also aided by the change in the indirect tax, indirect tax regime. I said one missing element in this budget. I was quite surprised is public sector disinvestment, a key element of non-tax revenues. Uh, it's not political funk because this government has made it a policy statement and they sold Air India. So why is it missing in the budget? What is your view? The, the, my view is that this is very political. It's still very contentious. And uh, I very recently was talking to a couple of bureaucrats who are involved in any of this and they're saying that, you know, we don't want to do it. That it becomes contentious uh, in, a, in a thing. Also, in interim budget, would you want to do it? No. Why? You'll do it in July and it'll be big bang. You have to understand the psychology of the man. I mean, he's not going to do it like this. He'll make a big occasion out of it and make it transformative. This is uh, for the routine bureaucrat to say, ha, let me fill in all the boxes. Uh, you know, tick all the boxes and get the brownie points of uh, the thing. That's not how this government functions, how this prime minister functions. So he does it differently. And I'm sure you'll see a you know, big bang thing in July, whenever that happens or that is spent. So I don't see it as a missing element because you're constantly, you know, kind of looking for things which an interim budget should not. At the end of the day, you are seeking expenses and saying, hey, boss, I need to work till till July, so give, give me permission to do so. So, Asif, what you're saying is that uh, we should expect a big bang budget assuming the confidence of being re-elected plays out. Yeah, of course. Because, you know, you're constantly talking about this, you know, the nation first and which you have shown in this budget, the uh, party second, because if it was always but if it was a budget about the party, then you would do freebies. Because you're look you are reiterating the whole point of uh, symbolically saying that country first, so country doesn't need freebies right now, so you made a transition. Once you're in into a thing, yes, you would see the budget for the next ten years perhaps, which will kind of free up. And now I think somewhere what the sense I have is BJP has come onto its own. And they, they do things differently. So whether you agree with it, disagree with it, there's no denying the fact that there's a transformation, good or bad. I mean, that's a judgment that we can take later. But it's a different way of doing things. Um, and it, it is very, very politically oriented, even as it may seem harmlessly uh, academic and whatever. It is deeply political. And as I said, I compared it to, the, to, a, to a chess game which is really, that's otherwise, I have never heard a budget speech which has a uh, reference to a chess uh, match between, uh, you know, uh, Man Carlson and this fellow, uh, which was anyway lost. But the metaphor really being that this, this budget is a gambit. It's a chess gambit, which is uh, that, you know, I, I will forego a short-term opportunity, but for a, for a long-term positional advantage. And that is what, uh, how I see this budget. This year's vote on account took everyone by surprise. The National Democratic Alliance passed on the opportunity to indulge in electoral freebies. With this, they've broken the political precedent. I don't know how many of you recall, but in the run-up to the 2009 general election, the United Progressive Alliance had announced a massive farm loan waiver of around 60,000 crore. And then in 2019, the same NDA had announced a PM Kisan program plus SOPs for the middle class. This time, all of it is missing. The big question is whether it's a structural break, whether it sets a new precedent where good economics will define the politics in this country. We'll have to wait and see. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Strat News Global on YouTube. Hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any updates. And please do share your thoughts, ideas and suggestions with us. I'm available on Twitter at Capital Calculus. I'll be back next week with another episode. Till then, stay safe.